In the following, we will be giving a general overview of the Hakka language and its speakers. The Sinitic languages are a distinct branch of the Sino-Tibetan language family, consisting of various local varieties, many of which are not mutually intelligible. In China, they are all called Fang Yen, which means regional speech. We might call them Sinitic languages. The larger part of China is mostly covered by a range of dialects, which is all called Mandarin Chinese dialects. And from these dialects, the Beijing variant, uh, also the modern standard language is derived. The south of China, on the other hand, is home of various uh, rather distinct Fang Yen with their own names and identity, most importantly Hokien or Minnan in the Fujian province, Teochou and Yue and Hakka, and uh, in the north of Hakka, Gan in Jiangxi province. The dark green spot on this map is the area where Hakka is spoken, where Hakkas are living. If we look at the administrative subdivisions of China, we see that Hakka does not have a province of its own, but is spoken in the provinces of Guangdong, Jiangxi, and Fujian, dispersing over southwestern areas in Guangxi and Sichuan. For this reason, it is actually difficult to estimate the numbers of Hakkas in China and the world. Considering the available information about the percentage of Hakkas in Chinese provinces, we find the following numbers from which we can see that the majority of the Hakkas live in Guangdong province with important numbers in Jiangxi, Fujian, Guangxi. Furthermore, there are many Hakkas in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and this would give a number of more than 52 million people already. It is, um, the Hakka spread out to over 80 countries worldwide, which is even more difficult to evaluate. The majority of the overseas Hakkas live in Southeast Asia and are most visible in Malaysia and Indonesia. There are Hakkas in Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, but they are more difficult to count as they are often assimilated to the local culture. The word Hakka, Chinese Kutia, means guest people, which is a somewhat strange name for an ethnic or linguistic group. We have said already that they do not have their own Chinese province, which is the first hint as to why they have this name. Geographically, the Hakkas originally inhabit the mountainous regions between the socio-economic centers of South China. And due to their migrational dispersion, the Hakka language is also a sociolect of a specific social group. In the homeland of the Hakkas, there is a Hmong minority, the so-called Shi. They used to speak their own language, which is now in use by only very few people. The other 700,000 Shi speak Shi Yu, which is a Sinitic language. This language is very similar to the adjacent Hakka dialects and might be counted among the Hakka language sphere. The origin of the Hakkas is unclear, but it is usually said that they came from the north in various migration waves. The Hakkas seem to have come relatively late in history, that means within the last 1,000 years, which is why they could not settle in already occupied areas such as the more fertile lowlands. And since the mountains were not fertile, Hakka men were rather mobile and went to work in the economic centers of Guangdong, often leaving the farm to the women. Many ultimately migrated westwards with their families. The name Hakka may be explainable from the fact that the late arriving Hakkas often rented land from landowners, which means they were not owners themselves and therefore were considered to be only guests. 
a number of historical ev events, which ca we cannot elaborate here, led to frictions between the Bunti, or Cantonese, and the Hakkas, which led to outright violence and even war. The large characteristic Hakka roundhouses, with only very few openings to the outside, appear like defensive fortresses for a reason. It is said that these ongoing conflicts actually created the Hakka identity. They were a shunned out group, which over time, due to this uh, uh, outgroup feeling, developed self-consciousness as a group. It goes without saying that therefore people in some other areas, for instance in Jiangxi, may not identify themselves as Hakka, but speak a related variety which should be included linguistically in Hakka language research. The Hakka see themselves as hardworking, diligent, clan-oriented people who keep close contact with their group and collaborate as a group. The women are able to work hard in the fields because they traditionally did not bind their feet. Because of their delicate situation among the other groups in the region, with no province on their own, Hakka seem to have always taken care to cultivate a double identity as Hakkas and as Han Chinese. And this loyalty to China led to many Hakkas playing important roles in politics. Beside the above man mentioned roundhouses, Hakkas are routinely known for the so-called Hakka mountain songs, a custom which previously served as a means of communication between the mountain hills. The Hakkas partly have their own cultural traditions. In Singkawang, Indonesia, the Hakka Chinese Chap Gourmet Festival on the 15th day of the Chinese New Year attracts many tourists. It has become a prominent cultural event. The Hakkas are one of the larger immigration groups from China. Most Hakkas moved to Taiwan and Southeast Asia, but also spread worldwide, for instance, to Suriname. Hakkas who emigrated early in history often mixed with local populations and developed distinct cultures and sometimes Creoles or mixed languages. The Peranakan in Malaysia and Indonesia or the Hakkas of Bangka Belitung Islands are examples for that. Hakkas were very good at land reclamation and their closed group practices helped create administrative structures. They were miners and um, cultivators of borderlands and they connected the political powers at the coastline with the native people in the jungle. But let us turn towards the language now. A language of 50 plus million speakers has dialects of its own. Being a non-standardized language, we can assume there is a dialect continuum without a center. Conventionally, Meixian is nowadays considered to be the cradle of Hakka language. It is a de facto standard. Hakka being dispersed into Guangdong and Guangxi, many speakers may be proficient in Cantonese or may have given up Hakka altogether. It is known from Hong Kong and Macau that only old people still speak Hakka today. The Sinitic languages in China could be compared um, to Romance languages insofar as both groups derived from one imperial languages, language and then diverged. It is therefore interesting to compare the various languages to each other, which is relatively easy to do in the multilingual situation of Malaysia. The following is a translation of a sentence into Malaysian English, Hakka, Cantonese, Hokkien, and Malaysian Chinese. And it contains a loan word from Malaysian, Hutang, and in English it contains a loan word from Cantonese, Chapo Dim. So, when English speakers would say, last time we go to Chap for Dim by things are Keno Dangwan. This would be in Hakka, Kyu by Ngadiohi Chap for Diam Mai Dung Si, 
Peyute to Tange. And very similar in Cantonese or Hokkien or in Malaysian Mandarin, which is influenced by these South Sinitic substrates. Yichian, Woman, Cha Cha Hua Dian, Mai Dong Si, Si Yau De O Dang De. As in other parts of the world, the first to um, work on the grammars were missionaries uh, learning the local languages. Before all, the Basel mission uh, was working on Hakka dictionaries and grammatical notes, as well as Christian translations. In modern linguistics, the first grammatical description was made by Hashimoto in 1973, on the basis of one Meishian speaker. In 1993, a Chinese scholar, He Gong Yong, wrote a Hakka grammar in Chinese language. Otherwise, Hakka is of interest for historical linguistics of Chinese. Instead of going through phoneme tables and so on, let us just get the feeling for the pronunciation of Hakka. Let's read these few sentences and compare them to standard Chinese. Ngai kin nen chon loi ko nen, wo qin yen hui lai ko nen. Ngai loi pai hong bao, wo lai pai hong bao. Sun pen xiu hong bao, shun bian shou hong bao. Hong bao. Uh, one of the most striking phonological features of Hakka is the existence of coda consonants which are altogether absent in Northern Chinese. So one can certainly establish phonological correlations between uh, Standard Chinese and Hakka. So Lai is Loi and Yao is Oi and Ai is Oi, for instance. And He is Ho and Ge, ge, ge is Ako. And sometimes there are different lexemes as shuo and gong. There are eight tones in Hakka. Two are called checked tones, and they are related to these coda consonants. Um, again, it makes no sense to give the system here because it diverges between the dialects. In the romanization of Hakka, Numbers are usually used to represent the tone contours on a scale from 1 for low to 5 for high. Let us discuss a few grammatical aspects, not systematically, but in a few selected examples. Um, word formation is certainly very similar to other Sinitic languages. For instance, the suffix ga is the Chinese jia, uh, is a derivation for adjective nouns. Ying yan hokka, the linguist, yu yan xue jia. Similarly, xin sang and xian shang are the same word, distinguished only by phonology. Um, there are the usual complex uh, rules for reduplication, but one more peculiar uh, feature is the reduplication of meaningless syllables um, following a noun and giving uh, a special meaning to this noun. So, gyokyakya means spreading legs widely, or mukmimi means looking with eyes half closed. Um, many differences come more from uh, usage habits. If, for instance, one would translate I am a teacher, Chinese wo shu lao shu, into Hakka, one can perfectly say ngai he xin sang. However, uh, Hakka speakers would more often say ngai he gao su ge, I am teach book one. And this gao su, of course, correlates to Chinese jiao shu and is known in Chinese as well. The construction he and ge is uh, structurally similar to the Chinese uh, structure shu de. Um, 
One can test it with other instances. I'm a car seller. I have my tie. I'm a taxi driver. He's a taxi driver. He has a taxi, and so on. Um, gender suffixes. This is one other peculiar feature of Hakka, which the speakers are conscious of. The gender suffixes for nouns. Gung means male, ma and po means female. This works quite well in order to distinguish the sex of animals, for instance, rooster and chicken, cows and bulls, and so on. But it doesn't really make sense with hakung for prawn, but kyam to po for toad. Body parts are also receive such suffixes. Ni gung, the ear, is male, but set ma, the tongue, is female. Nen gu, the breast, is male. And then words such as thunder and sky are male, but knife and ladle are female. Let us uh, keep in mind the two last words. Wok ma, the wok, is female, and von gung, the bowl, is male. Chiu, 2006, um, wrote an article about uh, the meaning, the meanings of these suffixes. And she comes up with the explanation that ma is used for soft, sunken, hollow objects and things people cannot see, which are implicit. So for instance, wok ma, the wok, remains in the kitchen, but von Gung goes to the dining table and is male. Male is the opposite, stand uh, for upright things, protruding objects, something people can see, something which is explicit. Ma can also stand for small things and gung for big things. There are even more uses of these suffixes which we cannot uh, describe here. Um, the personal pronouns of Hakka uh, are as follows. Ngai, ngi, gi, ngadjungin, ngidjungin, gidjungin. There is no differentiation between inclusive and exclusive plural. The possessive pronouns have slightly different forms. Nga, nya, gya. They can be followed by a ge, which is the equivalent of the. It can be nga ge or nga e. Um, the basic syntactic word order is subject, verb, object. And there is optionality of all components if they can be implied. So let us read a few simple sentences. Many aspects of grammar are similar in the Sinitic languages. So we also find topic prominence, where a topicalized element can be moved to the front of the sentence. Hakka sentence, mun fung chui hi bang bang kun. The door, the wind blew, made bang bang sound. Or, gim zai a boy zu toi yi tong cha bun gi. Gim zai, a boy bought the car, give him. Um, if we try to establish possible differences between uh, standard Chinese and Hakka, it might be interesting to look at the Ba construction, which is much discussed in Chinese grammar, and which puts the object before the verb with the help of the coverb Ba, when the object is clearly referenced. So it is somewhat similar to differential object marking, depending, however, on difficult to characterize constraints. Give me the phone in Chinese would be ba shou ji ge wo, but in Hakka it is only den fa bun ngai, without the ba. If we try to translate ba chu shi gan jing, uh, so uh, wash the car, um, in Hakka it is a cha se gon chiang gi, and here we see there is a obligatory demonstrative in front of car and there is a placeholder pronoun 
at the end of the sentence where the object usually should be. In Malaysian Mandarin, which is influenced by South Sinitic, the sentence can be da. So the da is a copy of the structure. If we use uh, another example, Bachelzumaila, sell the car, this again in Hakka is Ata Mai Hoi But there are alternatives such as Tana Loi Mai Hoi with serial verbs. Or to read uh, the, f the following uh, full sentence, Lao Fu Ta Mai Hoi Nga Diu Oi To Ba Ta. Here, the demonstrative and the placeholder pronoun are missing now. Um, and ta can simply be put between subject and verb. But ta, of course, is a blend between English bus and hakka ka. This example is from Malaysian hakka. Um, it turns out there are more co-verbs which can have partially the functions expressed by ba, for instance, dead or lao or jiong. And jiong leads us back to the ba construction because Chinese jiang can actually replace ba in formal writing, therefore might be considered more elegant, more archaic, older. Um, let us look at data in Malaysia, an old lady said, Ngadio oi chiong aba atzak cao pai gua gao gao. So we want the father's signboard hang high using chiong. In Sabahan Hakka, in Sabah, we find Bongi uh, Kepin Gon Yim which is help you relate to Guan Yin, which means you relate, or for you relate to Guan Yin. Ke bin yuk wong tai di, you know somehow Guan Yin lao ngai kao yu yen lo. Lao in this case has the usual meaning of with and not of ba. Nga ma jiu jiong ngai hi ke bun Guan Yin lo, my mother, related me to Guan Yin. That is a Ba function. And in Sinkawang, we got another verb in another Hakka dialect. Nga lokung gak ngai mo fit ki liao. So my husband gak my motorbike road. Uh, speaking of ba, maybe we can speak of the bay construction, which is called a passive in Chinese. There is no bay in Hakka, but bun, to give, can play that role additionally to the functions that gay or bun already has. He, in his grammar, gives the example sam bun gi um, So, shirt, give he, uh, torn, the shirt by him torn, but often this boon construction can be omitted. Kia cha mai hoi, his car sold. Um, otherwise, boon has a number of functions. Trying to translate the ba sentence in Indonesia led to a passive construction. Wo ba ta de shu nong bu qian la was the input sentence. I lost his book. And the answer was, Gya shu bun ngai mietn kian hiet. So his book, by me, make not see. This sentence could be rendered as, ngai chin n gen gya su hoi, which would be the active construction without any special marking. Um, in response to the ongoing discriminations of old, the foundation of the Tsung Tsin Association in Hong Kong marked the beginning of Hakka self-awareness of fighting back. Overseas Hakkas are often organized in so-called Hui Guan, 
or clan associations, and in many places also there are Tsungtsin associations. These associations reflect the collaborative spirit of the Hakkas. Furthermore, there are biannual World Hakka conferences which bring together Hakkas from all over the world to foster the cooperation and friendship globally. The Hakkas outside of China find themselves in various multilingual situations with other Sinitic varieties and with other languages. In Malaysia, Hakka speakers usually also speak some Cantonese, possibly Hokkien, English, Standard Chinese, and Malaysian. This leads to many interferences between these languages through borrowing, code switching, and structural convergence. In the following exa example, an English dialogue of Hakka speakers turns into a word play where a Hakka word, Chintai, whatever, is deliberately wrongfully interpreted by a similar Chinese word, Chintai, vegetables. What do you want to drink? Chintai la. Here got no Chintai. Here got copy tea or choose. You want Chintai, you go to Basar. In this example, the Hakka speaker, while explaining the hardships of his family to learn standard, probably written Chinese, all by themselves, he switches to Chinese whenever mentioning the learning effort. The green part is a standard Chinese, Malaysian Chinese, of course. Um, finally, in the last sentence in 35, we find a Hakka sentence with two loan words, one from Malaysian, one from English. Gibun mada loka poi, he has been detained by the police. Um, please also note the passive construction with bun which we just have described previously. In some places, Hakka is extraordinarily strong. For instance, in Sabah, Hakka is the lingua franca of the region. That is, other people are also learning the language. Since many first migrants were men and they could not bring Hakka wives with them, inter-ethnic marriages w between Hakkas and local people led to the formation of a new ethnic group, the Sino Kadazan, a mix between Hakkas and Kadazan Duzun people, often speaking Hakka and following Chinese customs. Um, Sinkawang in the west of Borneo, on, on the Indonesian side, is majoritarily a Hakka town. The Hakkas, the local Dayak people, and the Malays form a unique culture which is called Chidayu, an acronym for China, Dayak, and Malayu, or sometimes Tidayu for the Sinitic Tionghua for Chinese, Dayak, and Malayu. The Hakka speak Hakka and Indonesian. Standard Chinese is introduced only slowly in these days. The Hakka language has many Indonesian loan words. In Taiwan, Hakkas make approximately 15% of the population. The Hakka Basic Law recognizes Hakka as one of the national languages, and it is used in public announcements, it is taught in schools, and it is promoted at many levels. There are also Hakkas in Taiwan who have a more complex background. For instance, this rather old consultant was born in Meixian, came to Burma as a young boy, and much later in life moved to Taiwan, where he is still running his shop to this day. These Burmese Chinese um, have their own uh, quarter in Taipei. Um, Hackers from U in Europe partly come from other countries uh, than China. For instance, the hackers in the Netherlands are from Suriname, Indonesia, also from Hong Kong and Guangdong province. The largest group of the Hakka, of hackers in Vienna comes from Calcutta in India. 
Their group is now split up between Calcutta, Vienna and Toronto and a few other places. And they meet each other in India, which is their homeland. The Indian hackers of Austria work together in Chinese restaurants all their life so that the older first generation migrants do not even speak much German. As a minority language, Hakka is experiencing language change through influences from other languages and language shift. That means the language is given up in the youngest generation. Um, in Taiwan, for instance, in spite of the promotion of the language, the Hakkas use more Chinese than Hakka. Um, in this example, a mother explains how she taught her child to speak uh, Hakka and understand Hakka, and she said literally, Nga seng in voi, ying wei wo hui chang po, wo hui gan da chang, ti yit ki ki tang sit, ni chang shama ting putong, and so on. As we can see, she uses both Hakka and standard Chinese, and she uses it this code switching quite creatively by uh, uh, playing her role as a Hakka speaker and the, n the, the not understanding part uh, by her uh, child. Um, the young Hakka teenagers in Vienna are quite good at speaking Hakka because Hakka is their family language and they grew up speaking Hakka. But certainly German is their stronger language and they are cons to be considered weak speakers. Um, so to come to conclusions, Hakka is interesting for historical linguistics uh, because it is less innovative than Mandarin and therefore gives us certain glimpses to older versions of Chinese. Hakka is as such a non-standard language. It has not been standardized as such. And therefore, we find a dialect continuum with a lot of variation. And at the same time, it is under the influence of standard languages everywhere. In China, it is under the increasing influence of Putonghua. In other places, it may be influenced by local national languages. This seems to lead to rapid language change through borrowing code switching conversions of patterns. And it seems to be no longer learned as a first language by the youth in most parts of the world. So we must expect that language shift is imminent and that Hakka, like all non-standard languages, might be replaced by the various, the respective standard languages. We would like to finish with a photo with dictionary author Chin Aweng, a Surinamese, now Dutch Hakka, who spent 20 years of his life to compile a Hakka dictionary in order to preserve the memory of the language, which is now much less used by the younger generation. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you found it interesting.